It's an honor to have with us the most vibrant politician I have ever come across in my life. Ladies and gentlemen, presenting the Honorable Member of Parliament, Sarah Connolly, Labour Member for Tamit. Sarah, as uh, someone who's worked in the criminal justice system and from there to Energy Future Australia, and now as a parliamentarian, uh, you understand best as to what this land means. Uh, as a woman in uh, politics, what is it that the one thing that you really wish to bring a change to? The one thing I would really wish to bring a change to is to see more women run for uh, uh, seats in parliament and more women to strive towards having senior uh, portfolios and towards leadership positions. So we know um, in the history of Australian politics, we have only had one female Prime Minister, the wonderful Julia Gillard, who I'm very happy to say uh, was the local member for the seat of Lawler, where my state seat of Tarnit actually sits. So we had the, Australia's first female Prime Minister um, who was the local member um, uh, in the area that I represent. Um, in the history of Victorian politics, we have only had one uh, female Premier, and that was the wonderful Joan Kerner, who was another fabulous um, Westie here in Melbourne's western suburbs, and she was the member for Williamstown. So I think uh, with more women uh, putting their hand up and running for politics and parliament, um, I'm hoping that we can bring about change as a collective um, to have more women in politics, more women in senior positions. We know that the country um, uh, will benefit and, most, and indeed the, the state as well, whether you are male or female, regardless of your age, your background. The more um, diversity and gender diversity in that, that we have around the table, around the halls in which important decisions are being made, um, we know that we will have better outcomes and not just for women. So we've seen examples of that when it comes to um, uh, family violence. Victoria undertook the first Royal Commission into uh, family violence here in Victoria and are rolling out over 200 recommendations from that Royal Commission that will help better protect um, women in this state. But we're also looking at protecting children who are at home and um, see, uh, you know, uh, terrible things at home and domestic violence. That's right. So there's better outcomes for children as well. Um, part of having a Royal Commission into family violence, and this is just one example, um, is because we've had more women sitting there in Parliament and calling for a, a Royal Commission and, and uh, an inquiry and investigation into um, family violence and disrespect of women in general across Victoria, but also not just to identify the, the challenges and the issues associated with that, but also to go ahead and identify the solutions and implement those recommendations so we can have a, a safer, fairer Victorian society for everyone. Um, so the more women we have in Parliament, the more women that run, the more women in leadership positions, I think the the better society for everyone that we can create. And I really hope to be part of that. Beautiful, and it's, it's heartening to see how Labour has managed to you know, keep the ratios almost equal. Almost equal. So um, the Victorian uh, Labour Caucus, so our party in government at the moment here in um, Victoria, we are almost, almost 50% women. And I believe that we are now over 50% um, ministers in um, the Andrews Labor government cabinet. And that's a really big deal. That's a big win for women. Absolutely. It's a big win for all Victorians. Thank you, Sarah. Um, we understand that Victoria has probably seen the longest lockdown. And uh, we understand that the entire state had very restricted movement. And we know it's in the best interest of the state, uh, especially the vulnerable. Uh, are you now receiving uh, the uh, tremendous support from the public for the same? We know there was a lot of you know, talk regarding this, there was a lot of unrest regarding it, but understanding that it's in the best interest, we, probably people are seeing it now. What do you see it as? Well, I see a, a community and a Victoria that's looking towards our future. So as a member for Tarnit, um, in my community out of Melbourne's western suburbs, 
in the city of Wyndham, we were hardest hit. We were the epicentre um, of, of COVID in Victoria, not once, but twice. And it's been a really difficult time, whether you've lived in Tunnead or out in Wyndham or um, in Victoria in general. Um, it's been a very, very difficult two years for people. Um, during those two years, you know, as the local member, fielding, you know, phone calls from constituents worried about um, their children not being at school, their job, um, family members who were sick with COVID. You know, I was there um, talking to uh, a, a people at pop-up clinics. I remember one in particular in Hoppers Crossing at a mosque and speaking to a gentleman who had come to get vaccinated, have his first vaccine. And he was there at that pop-up clinic because he'd had a family member pass away the night before. People, you know, people have died from this virus. People have died that um, uh, wouldn't have otherwise passed away because they caught COVID. And that is something that is deeply um, troubling, uh, troubling and upsetting for families who lost loved ones. Last year, the last year's lockdown was particularly difficult because what we knew is that um, we were celebrating um, days in our community of, of no COVID transmission. And then suddenly we had um, a situation where uh, we, I remember getting a phone call saying we had two or three cases that were identified in my local community. And very quickly, um, the state went back into lockdown. Now, um, those early days, it was really important to get communication out around not only the rules about lockdown, and I think Victorians after two years certainly know those rules, if not off by heart, mm -hmm. but the really important message about getting vaccinated and why that was so important and why it was safe to do so. Um, what was very upsetting for me on a personal level and as an MP last year was that we had to wait so long for the former Prime Minister to order and roll out that vaccination program across Victoria. Um, you know, we've seen, you know, small businesses struggle to recover after those two and a half years. I have spent a, a lot of time out in the community recently talking to small businesses that have survived COVID. Um, we have been able to provide a lot of financial assistance for those businesses. And what gives me a great um, sense of joy is businesses that have been able to um, uh, establish themselves after COVID. So it's saying that to me that our economy is bouncing back. And certainly as a, the Andrews Labor government is very much committed to helping support and nurture those existing businesses and new ones that are looking to open their doors um, very soon to the community. Yes, Sarah, like when you just said that, m tv is also humble to say that ESPA are one of those small businesses who uh, gain support from the state government. And yes, if it wasn't for the support, timely support then, I don't think uh, this dream of you know having this today here would have ever been possible. So thanks to you for all that. Um, and I think studios like this have been really important during what can only be described as some people's darkest days. And when we reflect on what we have as a nation, but also most importantly as a state, as, as Victorians, we've had to dig deep. And the, you know, the Victorian spirit has been tried and tested. And I would say our spirit is very, very strong. And one of the really important things during those two years of lockdown was people's ability to be able to access accurate, timely, trustful information. There's a lot of misinformation spreading very sadly across Facebook and community groups. And time and time again, it was very frustrating seeing particularly um, multiculturally diverse communities fall into the trap of seeing things on Facebook and, and, and thinking yeah, that was true. Yeah. That's right, whether it was about um, the vaccines or lockdowns, misinform misinformation during a global pandemic like that is really a very dangerous thing. So having um, a place where people can get information in language, in their mother tongue, that they can trust and is accurate and delivered in a timely manner, that's a really big, um, that's a really big deal. And it's, it's fantastic that you've been able to provide that. So thank you. Thank you. Um, well, Sarah, we know that uh, multiculturalism has become so much more pronounced than uh, when young Sarah moved out when she was 18. Uh, and your electorate, Tarnit, is one such that boosts of um, a multicultural um, society. 
um, and not to mention the advantages of the community centres, the schooling, public transport and everything in the outer west. Um, what is the one thing that you would love to see um, Tarni uh, you know, gain or achieve? Tarnit, uh, anyone who lives in Wyndham and has been to Tarnit knows what's, uh, what an amazing, amazing place that it is. It is a melting pot of cultures and people from across the globe, from every corner of the globe you can think of. And I know when I'm doing street stalls and out talking to people in my local community, down in Wyndham Village, for example, on a Saturday morning, I see... Um, the multicultural diversity is, is so exciting. And, you know, people come in, they might be dressed in their cultural, you know, their cultural dress. Um, they might be coming back from um, prayers or, or visiting places of religious worship. It is our diversity that is ultimately what makes us so, such a wonderful place to live. Um, and I think we um, have real strength in that. We are also a, um, so we were such a fast growing area in Melbourne's West. So Tarnit sits within one of the largest and fastest growing uh, growth corridors um, in Australia. Um, Tarnit and Truganina are just bursting at the seams. So we are having um, in our local hospital around about 130 babies being born each and every single week. That's over four prep classrooms, just to give you an idea about the growth. There's a lot of need in the community. And over the last decade, things have changed dramatically. We've gone from, you know, paddocks and people talk to me about um, being able to see cows and pigs and sheep and all kinds of things um, uh, alongside country roads. And that's now been turned into sort of housing estates and um, duplicated um, arterial roads for people to be able to drive down. There's a lot of need, there's a lot of bricks and mortar, very costly infrastructure that we need in Melbourne's West. So when we look at road, when we look at rail, when we look at the number of schools, all of these things need to be delivered and they needed to have been delivered probably yesterday. So the Andrews Labor Government has spent um, an incredible amount of money and time investing in our local community. Just the other day I was in Parliament talking about the number of schools alone inside my um, electorate that we have opened and set to um, open and deliver from uh, next year onward. So in just the short um, three and a half, almost four years since I've been elected, since 2018, I have cut the ribbon in three schools and I've got eight schools in the pipeline on their way, which will start to come off the ranks and be open from next year onwards. So there's a lot of investment in the area, but there's still a lot more to do. And I think at the um, state election here in Victoria this coming November, I'll certainly be out talking to my community about the great things that we have delivered, but also our plan, our future to keep delivering for people in Melbourne's West and most indeed the people of Tarnit. Um, one of the, the, the big sort of bricks and mortar things I want to be able to deliver for my community are train stations. So mm -hmm. what we know is we need less cars on the road and more people on our public transport. So the jewel in the crown for me um, on a professional level is to be able to del deliver, you know, train stations that are costing around, you know, 80 to 100 million dollars. And we've got a few of them in my electorate alone that I'm hoping um, I'm hoping to be able to secure um, as part of um, the election, upcoming election announcements and we'll be working very hard to do that. On a personal note, what I would like to see um, in my local community is more trees, more green space, more fabulous parks for families to go to and enjoy. So the demographic of my community are 32 year olds I was pretty close to being when I was first elected and you can count back my age and see how old I am now. But uh, 32 year olds with two young children and 32 year olds with you know growing families, they need places to go and play in the outdoors. They need um, you know plenty of, of, of playgrounds, recreational centres, sporting fields um, to keep us healthy, active, and feeling well as we you know, continue to get older and continue to grow. So there's a, lot of, um, uh, there's a lot of opportunity to do that. And one of the things that we do know is that Wyndham alone has less than 5% tree canopy. 
which contributes to an urban heat island effect, which basically means we are hotter and we are drier than other parts of Victoria that have more of a, a, a streetscape of trees and beautiful parks and more established trees. And I think one of the challenges for growing suburbs like mine, and certainly growing suburbs in the southeast and northwest, is to ensure that we are, are building estates and people are, are moving into homes in communities that are great places to live, that actually enhance the lives of young families. And I think that uh, increasing that tree canopy from 5% and going up, which will be plant, planting uh, lots of trees and more established trees, is something that's not only going to benefit the community now, but most certainly when people's children you know, are grown up and they're having children, it's something that they can you know, enjoy and, and talk about um, uh, for years to come. Beautiful. Talking about trees and the environment in general, uh, well, just as much as I'd like to hear otherwise, um, we know that Australia is a long way away from clean energy. As someone who's worked in Energy Australia for 13 years, what are your thoughts on this? What should be done? And what do you think we can contribute as individuals? Well, it's incredible because when I think about my career um, before politics, and I have worked in Australia's energy sector for uh, over a decade, around about 13 years, and I've worked in different cities in different states. and. Um, I remember the time when, you know, sitting around the, the table having a conversation around energy and energy prices and utility bills was, was something most people were like, oh, Sarah, we don't want to hear about that. It's very disinteresting and let's talk about something else. But now it's actually talked about in the homes of Australians right across the country um, more than ever before. I remember a time when, you know, we were looking at solar panels and electric vehicles and the possibility of that renewable technology and how it would operate within the energy grid was something that almost seemed like a, a sci-fi movie. It was so fictional and far off, it was hard to believe. And now it's here. The future is, is here in the now. And it's about how to have that um, incredible energy mix and that ecosystem. And, and really it's, it's moving towards renewable technology and zero emissions and a cleaner energy future for Australia. It has been traditionally for Australia a very slow march towards renewable um, energy and clean energy. And part of the reason for that is the real inertia and, and lack of um, decision making and inability to take us forward um, at a federal government level. And I know that from years of conversations around um, uh, the tables in the various energy networks that I've worked within, it's really important for investors to know what the government's plan is for energy so that they're investing for the now and for the future. Um, I feel like now that we've finally, <laughs> after nine long years, um, a, a federal Labor government has come to power, the Albanese um, Labor government and I feel like there will be real change because I think there's been a lot of frustration over almost a decade. There's been a lot of um, ability to create policy. Um, uh, the market is ready for that change. They've just been waiting for a change of government and I feel like we've got that now. One of the things that um, can, you know, shows you that we're ready for change is that because at a federal level um, there was such stagnation and we were so stagnant for so long, the states like Victoria under um, a Labor government, once we got into power in 2014, we were like, let's go. There's so much to do. And the amount of um, heavy lifting that Victoria has done towards trying to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and transition to that renewable energy future and um, you know, clean energy targets um, has been remarkable. And I'm very proud to say that in Tarnit and Truganina and out in Wyndham, Melbourne's West, we have some of the highest uptake of solar panels than anywhere else across this state. I think we're second only other to the southeast in Cranbourne. And that says to me that um, you don't have to be living in the inner city 
to believe in um, climate change, to want action on climate change, to be passionate about the environment. Families in Melbourne's west in the outer suburbs are really passionate about the environment and that's because they're young families and they're thinking about their children's future. So things like the Solar Homes Program, we're looking at rolling out batteries. Um, just in Tani alone, we're going to be getting a community neighbourhood battery, which will help power, I think, around about 170 homes. So this means that people who may not be able to afford a battery, for example, um, but do have solar panels, they will be able to um, uh, work with the neighbourhood community battery to help share power, um, all of that kind of thing which, which we talk about being a, a, a community ecosystem of renewable technology. So we're starting to roll out exciting things like that. Um, but most certainly um, a lot of heavy lifting has been done by the states and um, you know, we have a, a remarkable, remarkable um, climate change and energy minister who's deeply committed to tackling climate change in this state and doing a lot of heavy lifting behind the scenes, which is paying off. We are seeing enormous, enormous change in this state. And we are showing that by investing, by giving the right um, price signals to the market, we're, we've seen a swell of a, a emerging technology that we're now, ab now able to tap into, to pilot, to trial. We talk about having little sandboxes where they can try out um, this new technology. We have seen that emerge here in Victoria and it makes me very proud to say that Victoria is again leading the way when it comes to um, uh, tackling climate change and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Something we should all feel very proud of. It's great, uh, at least you know that, you know, from the slow crawl that we were into, we're moving into a much more confident stride towards clean energy. 100%. <laughs> um, Sarah, we know that women wear so many hats these days, um, woman to woman. Uh, what do you think a woman's uh, greatest support is and what's her great worst challenge? Well, because we're talking woman to woman, I can tell the truth and I'm sure your viewers will appreciate this. Let me start with what our, um, with what our greatest barrier is and what, is, what I see as our greatest challenge quite often. And I know that for me on a personal level, this can also apply to me. And sometimes I think our greatest challenge is us, is ourself. And it's our inability to believe that we can do something. So one of the things we know about women is that um, we are probably more likely to be um, a little bit more humble about our skills and experience, particularly when it comes to being interviewed than our male counterparts. So I know when I was um, uh, asked to run for parliament, Despite having a law degree, having started off in the criminal justice system, of having over a decade of regulatory and policy work in the energy sector, the first thing I thought was, I don't know if I'm qualified. <laughs> Let me check my CV. <laughs> That's not exactly how politics works, by the way. But that was the first thing that entered my mind. It was that barrier of, I'm not sure if I'm skilled enough. And I think that comes down to confidence. It's about women having the confidence to know that they can do something. So when I go to schools and I talk to young kids, particularly young girls, about being how to be a leader and how to tackle um, uh, challenges that you know are, are put before them in their career, one of the things I talk about is the importance of being able to back yourself in and believe that you can do it. You might not know how to do it, but the really important thing to know is that you can learn how to do it and you can do it well. And I think that comes down to confidence. I also think um, a, a part of that when you're faced with challenge and it's something we can teach our, um, our daughters and the young women in our lives, and I certainly try to pass on to my 11 year old daughter, is it's really important to be resilient. Um, so it's having that confidence but also having the resilience. So if you take a bit of a knock, if you don't get that job. Be able to bounce back. Absolutely, and bounce back um, well, and just sort of pick yourself up and get on with it. Now, one of the, well, the other part of the question was. What, what's the greatest support? What's the greatest support? <laughs> well, I think, uh, I think for me, um, 
The greatest support in me being able to do my job, there's a couple. I have two young kids, my life is very busy. I wear many, many, many different <laughs> hats. Um, but one of, the, one of the greatest supporters for me is my husband. It is having his support and his belief in me when you know that confidence gets knocked and I think, oh, I, I don't know if I can do this. And he's like, yes, you can. Pick yourself up, get on with it. Um, I think that's really important for women to be surrounded by it. And whether it's surrounded by men and it doesn't just have to be your husband, be husband, it might be your brother anybody. or your father. And it's something that fathers should think about the importance of that supportive role and that role model they play for their daughters in, in helping build their confidence, build their resilience. So, you know, um, I feel like daughters will flourish from that sort of investment that fathers can make in building their self-esteem and confidence. Um, the, other, um, the other thing that really does offer a lot of support um, uh, as, as a member of parliament is being surrounded by so many other incredible female uh, members of parliament, by MPs and ministers. And um, I think that is really important because traditionally politics in Australia and indeed around the world and still in some places around the world, I'm sure we can all point to, um, is really male dominated and has been um, since what feels like forever. And it's really hard to break down that sort of that, that gender bias and that, and that stereotypical um, uh, uh, way in which we envisage politics and who a politician should be. And it's usually what in our mind we think is a male. Um, but it is really empowering to be surrounded by lots of women. So what that means is that, you know, if you feel like um, uh, you want to speak up about something, you want to raise an issue to deal with women. Um, and also the way in which you present yourself in the Chamber of Parliament, um, there's people like you around you. You see other women there, other women doing it, and they do it in a way that um, best suits them. So an example of that is um, in question time, um, you know, questions are asked to ministers of government and indeed the Premier or Prime Minister. The way in which sort of men yell across the chamber can be different to the way in which women want to in interact with each other across the chamber. Just because you're a politician and a woman doesn't mean you have to yell like the male colleague that might be sitting beside you. Um, but when you see other women in the chamber um, present themselves and you can get tips and tricks off them, it's an enormous support and it's also a, a mentoring type relationship that you can build that will help turn you into the most successful leader um, in whatever kind of career, I guess, that you want to be. So that's pretty special too. Thank you so much, Sarah. It's been an absolute pleasure interviewing you here for m tv and uh, thank you so much for your electrifying presence and all those words of this. Now, I'm sure our audience would have loved this episode and totally loved you for what you are. Thank you for being here today. Thank you. It's been quite an experience doing this and um, I hope people take away some of those um, tips and tricks, particularly when it comes to raising daughters and women in leadership. We need more women in leadership and the country will prosper. Thank you so much. Um, your final words for Ampo TV viewers? Final words? Um, oh, geez, I don't know. Final I words. I don't even call it final words. Um, <laughs> what would you like to share with Ampo TV viewers? I think it's really important to be able to look for news that you can trust and is accurate. There's nothing more important than that and having your facts straight and, and knowing, um, uh, having all the information so you're aware of what's going on in your local community. And I love that your viewers today are watching us and have watched us, uh, have watched uh, you, Sharma and the team for the past two years during the pandemic. Um, and I would say to all of your female viewers out there and to uh, the men, um, if you have daughters and sisters and all of that kind of thing, is to remind yourself to back yourself in, believe in yourself. Thank you. It's been Thank great you. having you in the studio. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>